you, thank you, conference. It is such an honor and still slightly unreal uh, to be addressing you today for the first time as the Liberal Democrat Member of Parliament for Oxford, West and Abingdon. I'd like to start, as I always do, by saying thank you. Thank you to each and every one of you who came to help at any point, I cannot thank you enough. To anyone who knocked on a door, delivered a leaflet, made a phone call, made a donation, but also to anyone who ever whispered some words of encouragement in my ear, you made a huge difference. And I promise that I will spend each and every day that I am in Parliament fighting tooth and nail for my constituents, but also for the liberal values that we all hold so dear. Of course, it has not been an easy road to get here, and I'm sure every single one of my colleagues in Westminster would say the same. And indeed, anyone who has campaigned in any type of seat for this party. We fought gruelling, exhausting election campaigns this summer. But in Oxwab, that's what the cool people call Oxford, West and Abingdon, by the way. We overturned a Tory majority of nearly 9,500 to win by 816 votes. To say I was surprised is an understatement. My uh, agent, Neil Fawcett, called me up about half midnight on the night to tell me that it was close but the wrong side of close. Um, so when I realised half an hour before the declaration that we'd actually done it, I ran outside to gulp down some air, wrote my acceptance speech on the back of a knock-up leaflet that I had in my bag. <laughs> and hours later, I was interviewed on Women's Hour, I did an event in London, and my feet haven't really touched the ground since. But I was particularly honoured to then be asked by Tim Farron days after the election to serve in the Shadow Cabinet as our spokesperson on education. And education is the issue that inspired me to get into politics. It's my burning passion. As a young teacher, go on. Yes, you have one too. <laughs> Thank you. As a young teacher, I was frustrated by the terrible mismanagement of schools by both Tory and Labour governments alike. But it was the issue of educational inequality that made me angry. And that anger led to action. And that action led to me deciding 10 years ago now to join the one and only party whose evidence-based policy would actually make a difference to the lives of children and work towards being an MP. Now, those 10 years have been bumpy for sure, but to anyone out there right now who's thinking, I'd really like to do that job, I've got a burning passion too, then I'd like to look you in the eye and say, go for it. I bet you'd be great. But I should tell you, the House of Commons is as, if not more, bonkers than I thought it would be. <laughs> I mean, some of it I was expecting. You may have seen I was jeered badly at PMQs when asking a question about 30 hours of free childcare. They were so loud, the Tory benches, that the Speaker had to put a stop to them and it made the papers. Now, fear not, my skin is thick, but I tell you, I have to regularly suppress my inner teacher very hard. <laughs> Detention, all of you. Punch and Judy politics is alive and well, as is the constant fear of saying you to a minister and being told off by the speaker. As I said, it's quite bonkers. But most bonkers of all are the complacent, often white, often male, MPs who only ever play party politics, the ones who are so obviously out of touch with their constituents and who, worst of all, get away with it under our voting system. Yeah. Their only burning passion is themselves. And that's why I'm so encouraging of anyone who wants to join me to disrupt that system. You see, you'll disrupt it just by being you. 
just by being in touch and daring to be different. I am more determined than ever, despite occasionally feeling like I wandered into a Harry Potter book, <laughs> to use my time there to make life better for real people. But the hard part is knowing where to start. So I'll start where I know best, education. Today's immediate challenges come no greater or more urgent than the devastating funding cuts under this government. We know there are billions of pounds of worth of repairs on our, outstanding on our school buildings. We know there are overcrowded classes, there are shortages of teachers, subjects are being dropped from the curriculum, and in some areas, parents are being asked to contribute to the cost of buying basic school equipment out of their own pockets. As a governor, I can tell you, asking this is the last thing that schools want to do, but it also represents something deeper and more troubling. The very foundation of our comprehensive school system is a belief that every child should be able to access a high quality education for free. Having to ask people to chip in a little bit here and a little bit there undermines that basic principle. What kind of country are we becoming that schools have to rely on handouts to provide the very basics to paint the walls of a classroom or fix a broken window to buy books or take their students on a trip. I recently heard of a school in my area that had to ask a local food bank to help it provide lunch. In my county of Oxfordshire, head teachers are warning that there is nowhere else to cut without seriously damaging provision. That's code for the next thing to go are the teachers. And things that we take for granted, that students will be taught for a full school day by a qualified teacher in a reasonably sized class, are now under threat. And the scale of these challenges is terrifying. But apparently, the government's only response is to plow on with the same obviously flawed approach. Millions of free schools, millions wasted on free schools in areas that don't need the places. Allowing private schools tax breaks, but breaking their promise to ensure that the taxpayer benefits too. A curriculum that excludes the arts and languages. League tables that encourage cheating. A teacher recruitment and retention crisis. A record numbers of teachers off sick and a disjointed admission system. I could go on and on and on. And make no mistake, if this approach continues to go effectively unchallenged, the catastrophic impact of this will play out for decades to the detriment of us all. But worst of all, when this government happily goes about playing politics with the education system, they fail to appreciate that this isn't a trial or an experiment for the children concerned. This is their one shot. And while I believe in lifelong learning, it's a biological fact that the way the brain develops in childhood is designed for learning. So if we don't get it right, then we face an uphill battle to fix the consequences later on. Imagine a baby whose parents don't have time to think and play with them, and that children's center that provided the parenting advice is no longer open. The impact of that will show itself from day one at school. Imagine a young person whose learning difficulty goes undiagnosed throughout their years at school, and due to lack of resources, they don't get the help they need, the impact will affect their entire career. And imagine someone who has always loved music and dreamt to go on to study it, but the school decides, due to cuts, that they're unable to continue offering it. That impact will affect them for the whole of their lives. Our education system has suffered for years from a lack of visionary leadership. The world is changing rapidly. Content is more and more available. And the prospect of a job for anyone, a job for life for anyone under the age of 40 is a nonsense now. The rise of artificial intelligence means more and more jobs are being automated and it's not just blue collar jobs anymore. The future economy demands a workforce that is flexible, emotive, creative. And what is the government doing? Narrow the curriculum, prescribe more content, 
and encourage rote learning. They are creating the very robots that will be most likely out of a job in 20 years, putting everyone's prosperity at risk. Like the punchline of my dad's favorite Irish joke, and no, I'm not going to do the accent. If I were you, I wouldn't start from here. Conference, today I would like to set down a challenge that we should and can provide that visionary leadership and become the party of education once more. to raise our sights and reimagine what our education system could and should look like. Rather than tinker with a fundamentally flawed system, let's explore what a truly modern, forward-thinking education system fit for the 21st century actually looks like. And we are the party to do it because education is built into our liberal DNA. To build and safeguard a fair, free and open society we must ensure that people have equal access to information, but also have the confidence to apply it creatively. To balance the fundamental values of liberty, equality, and community, we must teach people not just how to take care of each other, but also to know themselves and their own minds. To build a society where no one shall be enslaved by poverty, ignorance, and conformity, we must expose people to uncomfortable truths and empower them to have the courage of their convictions. So practically speaking, what does this mean? Well, I am a teacher after all. Let's have some audience participation. <laughs> Here are some radical starters for 10. Now, this is not party policy conference. That is up to you to decide. And I expect there might be disagreement. And this is the Lib Dems after all. But the point is, Let's start a debate and see where we go. So, here's the warm-up. Let's think about selection and segregation. Or, to put it in other terms, restricting access to education based on your parents' backgrounds or only valuing narrow definitions of ability. How does doing this help create our future workforce and more importantly, what values does it teach? Let's take one form of it, grammar schools. Boom. <laughs> My father was the first in his family to go to university. He was selected at 11 into the local grammar. His brother didn't make it. Their relationship suffered for years as a result. But my uncle went on to university too and ended up doing very well indeed. That policy served no purpose in my family except to tear brothers apart. And what does it teach children at that critical age? That some people are better than others? When in fact, that's not true at all. Now, the question is, is that really a lesson that we are comfortable teaching our children? <laughs> then why do we teach it then? Okay, next. Why are we so obsessed by league tables? What good, what good comes of encouraging needless competition between schools so they look like they have the best grades? What have we done? to create a school system where a school felt it needed to exclude pupils because they didn't get the required three Bs in their mock A-levels. And by the way, I believe that story is just the tip of the iceberg. The whole, the whole concept of a market in education brought in by both Labour and the Tories over the last 30 years has done nothing to address the attainment gap. In fact, in some regions in the UK, it's getting worse, yet the practice persists. The haves get into the good schools, the have-nots don't, the vicious cycle continues, and in the end, it's the children who suffer. Instead, what if we said everyone had to go to their local school, but 
We actually gave that school the resources and the freedom to be a great local school. What if instead of focusing our efforts on providing choice for parents, we thought instead, and I know this is radical, we thought instead about giving that choice to the students. Okay, last one, the plenary. Let's think about making education genuinely available to anyone who wants to pursue it at any age. One of my heroes, one, one of my heroes is a woman who I lived with when I did my masters. Christine grew up on a council estate in London. And in her 30s, she decided, being a single mum, that she was going to educate herself and make a different life for her kids than she had. So she got her A-levels, then did her part-time degree, then her PGCE, and when I met her, we were embarking on a master's in comparative education. All the while, she had to keep working to pay for it and support the children. Now, just because Christine came to education later in life, she had to pay for all of it. When others who'd had easier childhoods had it for free. Which brings me to the pink dancing elephant in the middle of the conference hall. I wore the jacket purposely. <laughs> Tuition fees. I believe it's time that we completely reimagined then, too. The thing is, I do believe that education is a public good and should be freely accessible. But I also believe that only supporting the 40% of people who decide early enough that that's the path for them is fundamentally unfair. What about the Christines of this world? Don't they need help too? What about those who study part-time or need to retrain or want to embark on a vocational course but have family responsibilities and can't make ends meet? What if we found a way for the state to help people access further education at any point in their lives? Now, many would choose to do that and go to university at 18, but equally, they could do it via a completely different route later, at a time that's right for them in a way that suits them, not when and how the state dictates they should. conference over the last few years, I could not be more proud of our party. Our resilience, our compassion, our tenacity, our membership has grown and grown. And yet again, we have defied the odds and survived political catastrophe. But what now? Conference, I believe only only the Liberal Democrats have the imagination and the gall to challenge our education system from the bottom up. It's time for us to be radical. It's time for us to be bold, to be brave. For the sake of our prosperity and our economy, for the sake of building a more understandable, understanding and more peaceful world, for the sake of not just our future, but the future of generations to come. Now is the time that we must enter into a new era to throw off the shackles of coalition and channel our energies into our creativity, to reclaim our place not just as the party of education, but also the party of opportunity, equality and freedom for all. Thank you. Woo!